Okay, thank you so much for watching another episode of Bayloric TV Boxing. It is an absolute honour to have two great men from In This Corner Boxing Podcast. Gentlemen, introduce yourselves. I'm Mike Mitt, the host of In This Corner Podcast. How are you doing, Ingram? I'm Steve Mittman, the executive producer of uh, the show, the podcast. Thank you for having us. It's our pleasure to be on with you. Great to be on with you. Um, it's an honor to have you guys uh, on the show and obviously being able to, you know, let other viewers get to know who you are and what you're about. Um, sometimes podcasts can be put to one side because of the rise of YouTube and so many people watching YouTube videos. Um, I think podcasts are fantastic and you guys are doing a hell of a job and it's time that the YouTube fans know about what you do. So tell us a bit more about In This Corner. Well, in this corner, uh, in this corner, podcast.com, a weekly uh, boxing show. We come out every Thursday, and we uh, feature, uh, you know, talk about some of the up and coming fights. We feature the fighters, and we also take a look back at some of the uh, classic fighters, the great fighters of yesterday. And uh, uh, a guest every week on my show is my longtime television co-host. Uh, the Hall of Fame heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Holmes. Of course, Larry and I have been together for many, many years, and we've traveled the world together, uh, announcing fights all over the world, and he's gracious enough to be here uh, on the podcast. We have a feature called Ask the Champ, and uh, you can ask Larry any question you want, and he'll answer it right here each and every week. Wow, that's a star sign you've got right there, isn't it? Yes, actually, um, I started in this corner as a syndicated television show, and it was a broadcast for over 20 years, uh, produced by Service Electric Cable TV, the founder, the originator of cable television in the United States of America. They invented cable TV and still the premier system here in the United States. And I'm still uh, with Service Electric. Proud to say that uh, I've traveled all over, been with a lot of things, but I'm still at with my roots with Service Electric Cable TV. Wow, some journey. So how long have you actually been in the game, Mike? I've been in the game um, since I, I guess I was seven years old. I was a boxing fan and I, I love to go uh, to watch fights I'm from right outside uh, Philadelphia, just north of Philadelphia, where a hotbed of boxing. So, uh, so many great fights as I was growing up in this area. Uh, my dad used to take me to boxing. Then I boxed when I was in college, and I, I majored in uh, communications. <coughs> when I got out of college, I wasn't a boxer. I didn't become, a, you know, I just did it in college. Uh, but I stayed with boxing. Uh, I officiated boxing as a referee when I was young. I could move pretty quick. I could, <laughs> I could move as fast as my as my uh, partner Larry Holmes. Uh, so I refereed a couple thousand fights. There, there probably isn't anything that I haven't done in boxing. And then um, I switched to uh, announcing fights. A lot of times in the early days in cable, I would referee the fights, then go in in the studio and and voice over the my own fights. So uh, it was me in the ring and me outside of the ring. And I've worked with some of the major networks throughout the country. I've traveled all over the world announcing fights, many of them with, uh, with Larry Holmes. So I've been in the boxing game, let's just say, a, a long, long time. time. <laughs> <laughs> the question I've got to ask you, uh, Mike, is and it's something that just came to mind when you said to me that you'd been and you've boxed yourself. Is there a distinct difference between somebody who has boxed reporting on boxing than somebody who hasn't boxed reporting on boxing? Because it would be obvious to say, well, the person who's been in boxing should know more than the guy that hasn't boxed. What are your thoughts on that? Good question. And you may hear arguments on both sides of the, uh, of the coin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here are my thoughts. And my thoughts kind of echo my partner, Larry Holmes. Um, you've got some announcers, a, a lot of announcers today have been in the uh, 
uh, the reporting business, you know, boxing writers. And uh, they do know the sport of boxing. They can tell you all the facts. They can tell you all the figures. Uh, they can get pretty in-depth at analyzing fighters, but they have never tried to get away from a left jab. They have never tried to, to you know, to, to get away from an uppercut. They've never been hit to the solar plexus. They only know uh, the reactions uh, from what they've studied of getting hit to the solar plexus, getting hit with a shot to the kidneys, but they've never taken them. So, you know, it's a lot better when you've been actually taking punches, as Larry would say, and you've taken those punches, you've tried to get away from punches, that you know what it's like to have a guy hitting you. Um, there's only one perspective, and, and therefore, you bring a lot more to the table when you've actually been in the ring. Absolutely. Um, there is a difference between somebody who has taken a punch, and when you're taking a punch and you're feeling pain, you understand what it's like to get countered. So then when you're seeing that somebody getting countered, you say, hey, he needs to make adjustments here because he's getting countered. Because you know yourself getting countered, what it feels like. You don't want it for somebody else. Yeah, and you say, wow, great left hook to the midsection. That hurts. How do you know that hurts? You've never taken one. You're just guessing that it hurts. But Absolutely. Been in the ring, you've taken one, you know. So I, that's why I bring uh, and always have offered a lot because I boxed. Uh, I know the rules of boxing because I've officiated a couple of thousand fights. I know every inch inside the ropes, every inch from all perspectives. And that's what I always brought uh, to the table when I called the fights, when I did my blow-by-blow -blow, uh, commentary. So, um, yeah, some, some guys, and I won't mention any names, uh, that do a terrific job. But again, they don't bring that perspective uh, to the table from taking a punch or trying to get away from a punch. Would you suggest that all these guys that are writers of boxing that have never taken a punch in anger, they do maybe a couple of rounds of sparring, maybe do a week of hard training, so they get a different perspective. I'm not telling them to become professional fighters or even have an amateur bout, but just to go through the training, take a punch, see some stars, get your nose bloody, take a body shot, fall down, you know, you know feel those things. And hey, then comment that you've got a different appreciation of the sport. And then... Great Final idea. fighters can look and say, yeah, at least I can respect you because you've been in the ring. You've taken some punches. A brand new perspective of everything they've been witnitzing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and absolutely. you know what I say, if you're going to go to the beach, go on the water. Try it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing I want to talk about, and both of you gentlemen chip in on this one. Um, I'm seeing a lot of commentators, and it seems to be the big networks, that if their fighter is on that network and is a network fighter it's well uh brown is throwing this and brown's doing that and brown's gonna win the fight and brown it's all biased for brown who is the, the the network fighter but clearly commentating or commentary is to give the viewers an unbiased view of what they're watching how is this seeped into the sport or into commentary isn't that deemed unprofessional well, basically the same as uh, a news commentator. He's got to do the news straight. He can't color it the way he would like it to be. He's got to report that news uh, impartially. Call it straight. Uh, the same way with commentary. It doesn't matter um, if the fighter's your network fighter and he's doing a bad job in there. Uh, you can't cover up because... There is no question that a boxing commentator has the ability to sway the the people watching because even though they're seeing one thing with their eyes, they're getting it from their ears, another sense as well. And sometimes what they're hearing can be stronger than what they're actually seeing. So they, they can be swayed by a commentator, and especially for the average fan that may not understand the sport all that well. So... Um, the commentators, you know, forget who they're working for. you got to call it straight. You know, I'll take it a step further. That's a really good question from my perspective because I ring announce. So I'm the guy in the center announcing the two fighters. I always uh, try to uh, take it upon myself to, when I'm introducing the blue corner or the red corner, I don't want to hype 
one guy over the other necessarily. Obviously, I have my personal favorites when I'm introducing fighters, but I don't want to make it sound like I'm favoring one guy or over the other in the very beginning of the fight, because honestly, that could influence the crowd right there, the way I say their names. It could influence the judges as well if they're not impartial. Um, and then even after the fight, when I introduce who the winner is, um, I, you know, I may, I may be happy that uh, a certain fighter won or defeated the other fighter, but I don't want to show favoritism by any chance. When I'm in that ring, I try to be totally impartial, and I'm not doing the color commentary like you are or calling the fight, but I'm still announcing the winner. I don't want to look overjoyed that one particular guy lost or happy that this guy won. I just want to announce who won, and, and that's that. Um, where I don't see that being the case with other people necessarily all the time. But that's a really good question. Ingram, let me just add to that. Obviously, we've established I've been in boxing uh, uh, quite a few years. And over the years, I've made many, many close friends in the sport of boxing. And I've had to call many of my friends' fights. But when they're in that ring, they're not my friend. I call it as I see it. And a lot of times I call upon my early days, going back 40 years, you know, uh, officiating fights. In those days, the referees uh, scored fights as well. Wouldn't matter if you were my cousin. If you lost that fight, you lost that fight. You had to be impartial. And again, in announcing, you must be impartial. Maybe a friend of mine, but if you, if you, if you get hit, I have to call. Hey, that he took... He took a good right hand, you know, or he got hit. Um, no, the punch landed. It didn't miss. It landed. And no, that was a knockdown. It was not a slip. So you have to call it the way you see it. And, and I always say the boxing fans appreciate honesty. They appreciate you being square. Okay. I'm going to come to you about the ring announcement, and then I'm going to come back to you, Mike. First of all, Steve, I'm going to ask you the question about ring announcing when you get a decision let's say let's give you a scenario sure Steve cunningham versus glasgow yes okay and you have to announce the winner now you from your eye have seen and you have an opinion of who won the fight and then you have to make an announcement what do you have to do within yourself to remain professional and not say ah this is a load of rubbish this this can't this this can't be right how do you Keep that because I've never seen Michael Buffer go to school and go. Oh, no, no, no way. What's this? No, I've never seen that. I've always seen that sort of. And then they make the they make the announcement. I've never seen the sort of like the. Again, like you said, it's not your call to make. The three judges obviously decided what they saw, and uh, it's not your call to make. You should not be adding any commentary or any. You know, obviously, you're not going to change it, but even by your facial expressions, you can't let that show. I have my own personal feelings on, on, on each fight. But um, the crowd knows, the viewers know, obviously. So I'm just there to do what I'm supposed to do. But you definitely, um, you know, for those of, of us or those of you that have never actually been to a fight in person um, and you've only seen them on TV, it's a totally different type of energy when you're in an arena and uh, not all of the audio is picked up on the TV cameras. And you just, you feel the energy, you feel the roar of the crowd or the lack of the roar, or you hear the boos and some of those boos don't translate over onto the TV cameras and get picked up in the mics, but you're hearing it, you're feeling it. So you just have to put yourself almost in a vacuum and just, re, you know, say sports cards. Have you ever been tempted when, you know, the crowd are booing to get in the ring and kind of do this sort of like to the crowd to get them even more booing a decision? <laughs> They do fine on their, their own. Yeah, me. you don't want to get a crowd going if they're already in that mood. <laughs> they do fine on their own. Okay. There's been some ugly times with some bad uh, scorecards. Yes, absolutely. Really real fast. There's yeah, okay. Inside the ring. And absolutely. I just saw. Um, and back to you, Mike. The question I was going to ask you is, have you ever, uh, you clearly have done, a, you know, commentated in a fight and you said, um, in my opinion, I think this guy's going to win. And it's been somebody that you know, and they're on the receiving end, and they're losing the fight, and they've got out of the ring, and they feel that you've kind of not given them the best props or not given them the kudos they deserve. Have you ever had to deal with that? And, you know, and how have you dealt with it? Well, a lot of times, you know, we'll give our prediction before the official decision is announced. You know, I'll say, Larry, in my opinion, uh, so-and-so... Uh, 
did the better job, you know, showed, you know, ring generalship, uh, landed the most punches, and, uh, you know, goes to some copy box numbers or whatever. Um, and then you find out after the official decision, you were, were not in sync with the judges. And then I'll further explain my theory why I thought that fighter won. But again, I will say the official decision is done by three judges seated at ringside, not at the broadcast table. So I may think this, but the official decision stands. So in commentating, and you've commentated with some of the best. Now, has there been any time when you're watching a fight and you're, you're commentating and then you've sort of turned to the comment and said, what are you, what are you talking about? That's, that's not happening in the fight. What are you going on about? Have you ever had to do that or have you ever felt to say that or have you ever kind of, has it ever happened when you've been commentating? When someone has come over to me? You mean? No, when you're commenting, say you're, com you're co-commentating with somebody else. Oh, well, co-commentating, yeah. And then you look across let me uh, answer that question. The problem is, usually his co-commentator is Larry Holmes, so you don't necessarily want to disagree with Larry. Right. <laughs> if it's somebody else, yeah. Then, then, but picture being somebody else. Oh, uh, yeah. My partner, I don't argue with. Right. <laughs> I don't want to, to get hit with the greatest left jab in boxing history. Right. Yeah. We we travel all over the world together and very close. And uh, yeah, I I will say at times, well, Larry. I respect that, but my opinion on this fight is so and so. With other co-hosts that I've worked with, um, you know, I appreciate their view because it would be a pretty boring world if everybody agreed on everything, uh, and that's not the case. And I said, well, I respect your opinion, but as I see it, it's the left jab that's the key uh, to this fight, and uh, the infighting has been uh, crucial in this scoring. And I'll explain why I see it. And then let the viewers, you know, uh, take take their pick. Because, no, you don't always get two commentators to, uh, you know, the, the eyes are funny. One eye will see one thing. Uh, somebody else's eyes will see differently. Like the judges. Yeah. Right. Um, Steve, the greatest ring announcer. Um, what makes a great ring announcer? Oh, gosh. You know... Obviously, in this day and age of the time in which we live, the two guys that come to mind, of course, would be Buffer and Jimmy Lennon Jr. Mm -hmm. I think Buffer is fantastic. I think he's awesome. He's incredible, obviously. I'm not going to say uh, one is better than the other, but I, I really love Jimmy Lennon Jr. I love his style. I love how smooth he is, how classy he is. Buffer's classy as well, but Jimmy Lennon Jr. is just real smooth. Um, there's a gentleman who, um, he was kind of, uh, a mentor and idol of, of, of mine going back when I was a kid growing up in the sport with my dad in the seventies and the eighties. I was just going to mention that. And he is known throughout the world. His name is Joe McHugh. He's and no you're, longer with us. You're from Dublin, uh, Ireland. Okay. Well, right outside of Dublin. You're from Ireland. And, uh, he himself was Irish and, uh, one of the greatest announcers of all time, Irish. Joe McHugh and uh, Joe had that ability. It's more than just straight facts on a ring announcing. Make no mistake, it's showmanship. It is a show. You're you're the conductor of that show, and you're there to entertain. You're there to add, as Steve will tell you, suspense. And um, Joe used to do that, and Steve does that as well. And uh, we worked on this, especially at the end. You may have an arena with twenty five thousand people in the arena, but if you know how to play it at the end, you could hear a pin drop when you're ready to, to give that decision. You have a little pause and you could hear everybody breathe. They go, and then you got them. For that 10 seconds, you have those 25,000 people in the palm of your hand. What does it feel like, Steve, being an announcer? You're in the ring and you're making an announcement that everybody's watching you. What does, what does that feel like? It's a very cool thing, not just from everybody watching, but just the fighters. You feel it. You really feel the energy of both of the fighters and their entire corners. You got uh, all the guys in the corners, and, and they're just anxious, ready to get the fight underway. You can feel the animosity. You can feel, you sometimes feel a little intimidation. And not, not me being intimidated, but I can tell ahead of time. When you're close, you're standing that close to a fighter, you can see, especially... When you reach underneath the referee's arm for the final instructions with a microphone and both fighters are facing each other, 
Um, there's more than just the visual. There's energy you can you can feel that just kind of exudes out of the fighters, off of the fighters, and you can almost predict who's going to win just from that alone. Um, I don't know if I would realize this have I not been there firsthand, and how, to, how, how if I don't experience this, but I do. So it's a cool thing. So you've got the energy from the fighters, from their corners, from their camps, and then of course from the audience and the crowd themselves. And of course, when you're in a in an area where there's a a favorite fighter, the crowd just, uh, you know, uh, predominantly cheers for them and, and, and you almost feel bad for the other fighters sometimes when you announce their name and you just get booze. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Let me give you both a fantasy situation. Now, first of all, a fight for you, Steve, to call. Oh, God. Which fight would you want to call? Two fighters in any era... Any time, put two fights together, you have to call it. Who would it be? You want to take that first? Well, um, going back a few years, uh, the fight that I would love to call inside the ring or our blow-by-blow commentary would be uh, um, two friends, Muhammad Ali and the great smoking Joe Frazier. And that would be uh, that would be the fight at Madison Square Garden Super Fight One. That was probably the biggest fight up to that point. With every celebrity, every star, everybody wanted to be a part of that fight. Okay, not Tyson Ali, possibly. That would work as well, but <laughs> but with Ali Frazier Super Fight One. Um, I actually did some of the pre-fight publicity uh, broadcast for that fight. Wow. Um, there was nothing like it. Believe me, um, uh, there was just absolutely nothing. They stopped fighting, actually. They stopped fighting around the world to watch that fight. Everybody stopped fighting. The Vietnam War came to a halt for those few hours. Nobody fought anybody. It, it, that was captivated the world it was so powerful wow wow so that's my 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 favorite fight to you know to do okay and steve well as far as me uh ring announcing I, I hate to give you a vanilla answer here but i'm just humbled and honored to introduce any of these incredible athletes in the room oh you can't go with that steve come on you can't do that that's cop out. Come on. He's waiting for the call to do Mayweather Pack. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> there you go. No, I'm joking. Go on. That'll work. Mayweather Pacquiao? Yeah. Uh, I would take that. I you would, would take that, but anyone yeah. else? I was well, fortunate of enough, too, uh, from working with Larry uh, um, and, and, and just some other top names. Um, I mean, so so I'd be lying if I, I mean, this is just where my personal, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of Triple G. I love Kovalev. Right. Um, a nice fight right there. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that would be awesome you like if that, that huh? was possible. <laughs> I like that fight. I like that fight. Yeah. Somebody's going to go. We talked about that one. You know, Kovalev uh, uh, comes down a pound or two and Triple G goes up a pound or two. Wow. Now, the rumors I've heard, well, not even rumors, this is from Abel Sanchez. Now, I don't know if he's been favoritist with, like, because Kovalev left him, but GGG intimidated Kovalev when they were sparring. That's what I heard. Hmm. Well, uh, Triple G could intimidate anybody. I mean, there's a guy, I, I really say, I'm not so sure he couldn't beat a lot of heavyweights. Uh, he, he doesn't know the word back up. He doesn't know the word fear. He doesn't know the word lose. He doesn't know anything but hit. And, uh, you know, he, you could put him up against Klitschko. He's going to come after him. He absolutely is. He absolutely is. Now, grudge matches. There's a lot of manufactured grudges. And then there's real, real grudges. For yourself, Mike, what's been the most intense bitter rivalry that you've known in boxing? There's been a lot of them. Uh, for me personally, because uh, I was right there and uh, still involved with it, was Larry Holmes and Jerry Cooney. And uh, there was a lot of um, 
animosity between the fighters, the fighters' camps. Most of it was stirred up by the promoters, not the fighters. I want to I want to mention that. Okay, the fighters, uh, but it, it got to the point where it got pretty bad. But uh, the great thing about boxing, most of these don't last. For instance, uh, today, Larry Holmes and Jerry Cooney, we travel together. They're the best, and I do mean the best of friends. They love each other. So most of these grudges only last while the fight is being promoted. Quickly after the fight, uh, it evaporates. And um, even in some of the, the cases where they've had three, four, five fights in boxing history, they go on. 20 years later to become best of friends. So you will find uh, boxing is, is a, a business. And during the time of the fight, yeah, these grudges can seem real, but they quickly go away weeks after the fight and they become very good friends. Eric Morales, Mark on Tony Barrera. What do you think? Was that manufactured? Or do you think that's a real grudge there? I think more manufactured. I, I, again, I believe it's to the benefit of the fighters. It's to the benefit of the promoters to, to make you think in your mind there is a real grudge match. If there were two fighters and they just you know kissed each other and told uh, everybody they love each other, I don't think that would sell a lot of tickets. So it, it's to the promoters and the fighters' benefit to uh, manufacture that, uh, you know, that grudge feeling. But that doesn't last. And save yourself. Yeah, I mean, we were talking. You were talking about Tyson Fury uh, before. I mean, that's why he's so popular. He's a showman. He understands entertainment. And the most successful fighters are sometimes not even the greatest fighters, as you well know. Um, but they 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 know how to put on a show. They know how much to. Uh, I don't want to say act, but uh, up as you say in America. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You know, and obviously going back to Ali, too, he was the greatest of all time, not just in the ring, but <laughs> putting on a show, giving people what they wanted, giving the fans what they were looking for. And, you know, that brings me back to um, uh, Manos de Piedra, Roberto Duran. Ooh. I've worked with him many, many times, been with him many times. Duran had that um, I'm going to kill him kind of, you know, kind of uh, attitude. And that's what made him and his fights so very popular, so very popular, uh, because he really did, when he was in the ring, uh, want to kill his opponent, so to speak. But outside the ring, he's actually very funny. He's got a great sense of humor. He's a wonderful, warm person, but that wouldn't sell tickets. So you know, in the ring, it was better for him to, you know, to want to take your head off. Okay, you guys are based, I believe, in Philadelphia, right? Or near Philly, in, Philly, in Philly, right? Just north of Philly, correct. Okay, so the home of brotherly love, as they call it. Now, yes. Yes. Now, home to Rocky. Now, we're not really going to talk about Rocky. We'll try and shift past that real quickly. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about being a Philadelphian fighter. And I want to talk about how that impacts the rest of America. Because according to... Uh, Roger Mayweather, the best fighters come from the Midwest. Now, there's an argument that their best fighters come from Philly. What are your thoughts about this? Well, if you come from the Midwest, the best fighters come from the Midwest. If you come from Philly, the best fighters come from Philly. Uh, that, that's a good bar argument, actually. You know, in any tavern across America, um, you know, the Midwest had some great fighters, but I'll tell you, the city of brotherly love if you can make it in the gyms, you've got it made. I mean, there's some of the best gym wars ever in the in the, the gyms. And there's like, at one point, there was like 150 gyms in Philadelphia, including um, Smoke and Joe Frazier's gym and many, many more. Schuler's gym, Champ's gym. My good friend, Mr. Joe Hand, uh, runs one of the best gyms in, in Philadelphia with Joe Hand uh, Sr. and Joe Hand Junior and so many super fighters have come out of those Philadelphia gyms. If you think you're something and you want to find out if you're something, just go into the Philadelphia gyms and spar a few rounds, and uh, you'll find out how good you are. Very oh. wow. Um, so while we're on the subject of Philadelphia, there's a fighter coming up challenging for the heavyweight championship of the world, Bryant Bye Bye Jennings. 
a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, are just blowing Jennings off. If he's too small, yeah, he's a Philly fighter. He's too small, and let's get ready for Klitschko, Fury or Klitschko, Wilder. What are your thoughts on this fight? What does Bryant Jennings bring to the ring? How much, what hope can you give the fans of B.Y. Jennings and Philadelphia fans and fans around the world of boxing? Steve? Oh, gosh. You know, Klitschko is so dominant these days. We all know that. Bryant's a super nice guy. He trains like crazy. He's a maniac at the gym. He's got a chance. Um, like anybody does. Klitschko's, at the end of the day, he's only human. Um, he doesn't have the strongest chin in the world. He's been knocked down before. Um, it's exciting that it's here on uh, American soil. Uh, you know, Jennings has got that to his favor. Madison Square Garden, of course, uh, he's going to be uh, the fan favorite, of course, in, in the States, most likely. Um, anybody's got a chance, uh, but, but we'll see. We'll see. Brian Jennings, a real, real gentleman. Uh, we've had him on In This Corner podcast.com before. And um, his people are great people. He's just a, a terrific gentleman. He's got his work cut out for him. You know, bottom line is when the referee calls you in uh, for the uh, instructions, calls you into the pre fight instructions and center ring, and you're looking at a guy six foot seven, um, you're intimidated. No question. He's a giant of a man. Now, uh, what things can Brian Jennings do? He's got the move. He's got to nullify that left jab through movement, through blocking, through getting underneath the jab. He's got to take it to him. He's got to land those right hands. He's got to put something on Klitschko early to keep Klitschko off of him. He's got to hurt him and, and hurt him early. He's got to stay, stay back. Traditionally, Jennings is a, a slower starter. This can't be. He's got to come out from uh, the uh, opening bell and take the fight to Klitschko. What chances does he have against Klitschko? Again, he's got to actually move Klitschko backwards. He's got to make him go backwards. He's got to uh, hurt Klitschko, throw some good right hands, expose that chin. That is the vulnerability point right there on the chin. He's got to expose the chin. And another problem for Klitschko is stamina. He's got to try to take that fight past five, six, six, seven rounds, see how Klitschko is going to hold up. If you keep hitting him for seven rounds, possibly he's got a, got a decent shot. Okay, okay. The next fight I want to talk about very quickly, I don't want to spend too much time on it, is Pacquiao Mayweather. Not so much the fight itself, but the interest in this fight the fans or the fanatics, people are so passionate about this fight. It's like, you know, then neither, a lot of these fans, not on Mayweather's paycheck or being paid by Mayweather, nor Pacquiao, but they're so passionate. They are so passionate. They would die for these guys. Why are they so passionate? Why is this fight grown to such an extent and, and it's causing so much? Uh, tension between people. Why? Why? What for? It's well, a boxing match. There's a reason for this. It's not just a boxing match. Right. Uh, you've got two of the best showmen. And remember, boxing is sports, but it's entertainment as well. Right. And there's some great boxers out there today that wouldn't sell one ticket. Uh, you know, you've got to have that showmanship. Floyd Mayweather is one of the best at promoting himself, promoting boxing. Love him, hate him, you pay to see him. That's why he is the undisputed king of pay-per-view. Some people pay to see him win, just as many pay to see him lose, you know, but he knows how to work it. He knows how to shove his brand new jet in your face and his 30 Mercedes uh, Benz cars in your face. And some people say, wow, that's cool. Other people you know, don't like that. Whatever reason, it doesn't matter. He's promoted himself to being a great showman. On the other, uh, the other side of the ring, Manny Pacquiao, a real people's guy. He's the people's champion. 
Not, you know, he's probably uh, the greatest thing to come out of the Philippines in a long, long time. And they love him around the world. He just has that smile, that charisma, the charm. He's an exciting fighter. You know when you pay X amount of dollars to see Manny Pacquiao, you're going to see a fight. No question about that. This is fight that people have wanted for over six years. They finally got it. And uh, two of the best, not only uh, fighters, fighting is only one part of it. It's the showmanship. Two of the best showmen in boxing today. That's why everybody is talking about that fight. And that's why people are going to spend money on this fight. You're going to have people paying for this fight that may never have bought a fight in their lifetimes, but they're going to buy this one. What does history tell us about this fight? Does it, like, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, similar situation. Mike Tyson was the baddie. Evander Holyfield's the good guy. You now got Mayweather, the bad guy. Pacquiao, the good guy. Does, does that have any effect in terms of judging and outside influences as to who's going to win the fight? Has the fight? Is the fight already a done fight? Is it already done or is it we really going to see a real fight here? In terms of the fact that politics may sway it one way or the other. I don't think politics is going to sway this fight. Um, the, the eyes of the world are going to be watching. So uh, the people are going to see what they're getting. So you, you can't do, you know, uh, politics, you know, the judges should not let that enter into their, their thoughts. The, the whole world will, literally, every country will be watching this one. I think it's going to be a great fight. You know the old saying, styles make fights. Well, they've got the right style for each other. It should be an exciting, exciting fight. You know, Mayweather at times has had some fights where he's bing, bing, jab, right, Hold, jab, right, hold. Won't do it. Can't do it with Pacquiao. It's like trying to tie up uh, an octopus. You know, he's always bending, twisting, turning. You're not going to grab him to hold him. So you're going you're gonna to have to fight. Punches are going to come at Mayweather from all angles, angles that he's never even seen punches come at him before. So what's going to happen? Pacquiao is going to make Mayweather fight, and Mayweather will fight. Your prediction? We'll speak later on that. Um, <laughs> it's a tough one. And that's what, that's what makes it such a great fight. If you could pick it like that, then it wouldn't be a good fight. But when you really don't know, that's what makes it a good fight. If I had to go somewhere, uh, I, I do believe Mayweather has the boxing skills and, and, the, and the power you know, to, to, to win. But something in my mind, something in my mind, it keeps telling me, Pacquiao's going to stun him, and uh, and um, he, he's going to pull this one out. Woo! Steve? Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to agree. I, just, I think Pacquiao, I think he's going to surprise him. I think, again, it could go either way. That's what's crazy about it. it. It would just be ridiculous for anybody to say without a doubt that this is what's going to happen. You really do not know in this fight. That's what make, makes well, your, your podcast has gone up by probably... One billion now because of <laughs> you come back <laughs> And I'd be lying if I didn't say a little portion of me is not also just rooting for Pacquiao. Well, there you go. Okay. All so. right, guys. Um, and to close, in terms of in this corner, what would be, if you were to sell it in 30 seconds, how would you sell in this corner as a podcast and why people should listen to you guys? So this is the 30 second elevator speech, huh? For yeah. the for the in this corner podcast. So why should people listen? Um, you know, I'm I'm gonna be straight out honest. Um, everybody's regurgitating the same old, same old stuff out there. It, there's a, a, an abundance of you can go to Twitter, you can go to YouTube, you can go to Facebook, and and there's nothing that we can talk about or anybody can talk about that you can't find instantly at the touch of your fingers these days, especially on Twitter. So we're not trying to scoop anybody because that's out there. It's been done. Everybody's doing it. Um, but 
Um, obviously, with Larry Holmes as a part of the show, there's an insight there to an amazing icon, a true living legend, number one right off the bat. We're honored and humbled to always uh, to, to be personally uh, friends with him and have him be a part of the show, number one. But number two, the insight that my dad, Mike uh, Mittman, will, brings to the table. You know, he's humble himself, and he won't say uh, – he's only gone into – he's only scraped the tip of the surface as far as his experience in the industry. But um, we're, we just – we like to uh, talk about what's really – not necessarily behind the scenes because, again, it's, there's so many people doing that. But the, the human side of things and especially um, the, the old school boxing and what, what boxing really ultimately always has been and still is all about. So that's what we try to We have to a lot the of the table. great fighters from the past, a lot of great friends of mine that we have on the show – and uh, we talk about, we relive some of the great classic moments uh, of boxing. So if you love to hear a fresh view on boxing and, and uh, from my special guest that I call on from all over the world, in this corner, podcast.com. See, that is absolutely beautiful, guys. Fantastic. See, just natural. Only problem, it was longer than 30 seconds. That's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so somebody on my YouTube channel is going to say that was more than 30 seconds doesn't matter it was great now just to close HBO or Showtime man you're throwing some tough questions <laughs> <laughs> you should have you should have read the disclaimer before you came oh, on the show no. guys <laughs> <laughs> they both great networks uh, I was involved with HBO when they first got started uh, through Service Electric. I've done stuff for Showtime. You know uh, what? <laughs> Ingram, we have a question. We're gonna, I'm going to throw that right back on you. With Heyman now in the scene, do you think that he's going to hurt HBO and or Showtime? Well, he, he owns so many of the fighters. I'll tell and you what happens here. Showtime are doing, we're doing, we're doing a great job. And HBO was lagging behind at some point. Now, HBO's going to have HBO's had to step up their game again because HBO were the dominant force for so long. It was HBO, 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 you know. And then, you know, Showtime had taken over for a while and it was the dominant force. And now you've got this premier boxing champions. Now that, the fact that Heyman's got all his fighters together fighting one another... There's nobody, no, Heyman doesn't lose because even if his fighter gets beat, exactly, it's in his camp. Right. That's the, that's a fantastic formula there. It got, the only thing up is, up the, only thing <laughs> the only problem with that is that when they've beat one another, then what happens? Then what happens? And you've got to try and start negotiating with HBO and Showtime to get fighters. That's the only thing there. But otherwise, for a while, you're going to have, you, Heyman's going to be a force to be reckoned with. And I think it's excellent because you're getting possibly the best fight in the best. I mean, you've got, you had Robert Guerrero and Thurman fighting, right? A great fight. You've got now, Gar I think Danny Garcia fighting Peterson. Peterson. Not a great fight. You know, we get in the fights. So we you're can't complain as boxing fans, but I think Heyman's done something that's great. I have to also add, um, what's that other, the, a Jay-Z's. Um, Rock Nation, Nation. Yeah. Rock Nation How do they come into the plan? How, how do they Because I think they've, they've signed Koto now So that's why I hear So what happens there? How does that work out? Do Rock Nation I know some people with Rock Nation And some good friends And uh, uh, they're the new kids on the block So to speak And uh, you know they've, they've got work The best way to do it is Subscribe to HBO and Showtime then you have uh, NBC. Yeah, then you have it all. If you're a real fight fan, you don't miss anything. Yeah, and then what about if you're in the UK as well or in Ireland? You got subscribed to Box Nation. There you go. Sky Sports. Sky Sports, great people too. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot. Um, so who's the best? Oh, you're going back. <laughs> You're not going to let us off the hook, huh? No. Okay. I, let, let me rephrase it. Who do you like listening to the most? You know what? That that's kind of impossible to say. They're all great on their given night. You know, one night, uh, one will be great. The other night, the other will be great. And uh, that's like asking me what kind of ice cream I like. When I'm eating chocolate ice cream, I love chocolate ice cream. When I'm eating vanilla, then vanilla's the best. When I'm eating strawberry, hey, that's great. Okay, let's re 
I'll put it another way then. What's the who presents their big their fights the best? Showtime or HBR? When you sit down to watch HBO HBO fight, do you get the same buzz as you get when you watch a Showtime fight? Well, I, I really like Larry Merchant, and uh, I, I think Larry just does, uh, you know, a really, really super job. Jim Lampley? I mean, did I say Larry Merchant? I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I meant to say uh, Larry always did a super job. Um, Jim Lampley, yeah, does a, a real, real super job. And, of course, Steve, our good friend, from New Jersey, the judge? Larry Hazard. Yes. The judge. That does the, uh, the scoring for, uh, for HBO. My mind just... Harold, Harold Letterman. Yeah, Harold, Harold Letterman. Letterman. Yes, oh, yes, man. Yes, I yes. was with Harold in Vegas. I was with Harold in, in Philadelphia. Uh, I've known Harold for um, whew, <laughs> 35, 40 years. Um, and uh, Harold, uh, I, I knew when Harold was, was, was judging, you know, when he judges, when he used to judge fights and he'd be on the circuit. And of course, Julie, his uh, lovely daughter, now judging. And Harold adds a, a great insight, <coughs> excuse me, to, uh, to HBO. Harold does a super job. And, and uh, Jim Lampley, uh, for my money, is, is a great guy and very, very hard to beat. I think he's the announcer's announcer. He does a great job. Not that uh, Mo Ranallo, uh, Ranallo does it. And, and of course, Polly Malinaj, a, a very dear friend of mine. Matter of fact, um, I've announced many of Paulie's early fights when he was wow. up for television. You know, wow. Paul and I are good friends. Paulie does really, as far as an analyst uh, goes, one of the best because Paulie can really pick apart a fighter's style. And again, we go back to that earlier part in the show. Um, nobody can pick apart a style like somebody that's been in the ring. And uh, Paulie's a good friend and a great, great uh, boxing analyst. And while we're on that, in addition to Lampley, of course, you got to give props to Max Kellerman. I mean, he is going to be the future of boxing. He already is incredible right now. But I'm talking when the, when people start retiring and uh, phasing out of the game, he'll still be around because he's a young guy. And, uh, he knows what he's talking about, I and mean, he's, he's, he's fantastic. So talking 10, 15, 20 years down the line, I think he's going to be huge, Max Kellerman. Fantastic. So I think we've got Showtime at HBR as a unanimous draw. It's a draw. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can complain with that. Guys, as we close, where do people get to see your stuff? You can go to InThisCornerPodcast.com. Of course, the podcast is available on iTunes as well. We'd love for you to subscribe. Um, but uh, the, the home base is the website, InThisCornerPodcast.com. And, um, you know, if you have a question for Larry Holmes, the champ, you can go to the website as well. We also have a separate website set up specifically for this purpose. It's AskTheChamp.com. And it's, we've, it's really a cool thing because you get to ask a personal question, and we will put you in touch with Larry. He'll answer it on the show. And you can go right to the website. You ask the question via the website, and, uh, and then we go to Larry, and he comes in. He sits down in the studio, and we play back the person's question, and he will answer that di directly to them. And uh, we're doing a cool thing, too, where if, if we use that person on air, we send you a T-shirt. So. Askthechamp.com. And on Twitter? In This Corner Pod, at In This Corner Pod. Fantastic. Guys, thank you so much for being on Bayloric TV. We really appreciate both of you, and we should do it again soon. Thank you. It's our pleasure. We're big fans of what you do. We've been watching you for a long time. It's just an honor to be with you. And if you'd like us to come to Ireland, we'd love to be there in the studio with you. Sounds fantastic. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.